Hi everyone, I hope you're all well. So, track star and Olympic medal holder Kasta Semenya has been embroiled in an argument with the International Association of Athletics Federations, or the IAAF, over whether or not she should be allowed to compete in the female category of certain events, namely the 400 and 800 meter middle distance running. Semenya has always been a topic of contention for the IAAF, as her dominance in the female category is attributable not just to hard work, but to the fact she has intersex characteristics. That is, while she has female genitalia, she has XY chromosomes, higher levels of testosterone than your average biological female, as well as internal testes and a lack of ovaries and a womb. Now, these typically male characteristics, namely the higher levels of testosterone, of course give her a performance advantage over typically biological women. And she has faced pushback over this from the IAAF for the entirety of her career. This has recently come to the pointy end of the issue. In April 2018, the IAAF announced new Differences of Sex Development or DSD rules that required athletes with specific DSDs to take medication to lower their testosterone levels, effective 8th of May 2019. Now this trumped the suspension of those rules in 2015, which was owed to a case brought against the IAAF by intersex runner Duty Chand. The Court of Arbitration for Sport found that there was simply not enough evidence to suggest that higher testosterone levels gave women a performance advantage, but it gave the IAAF two years to find the evidence to reimpose the rule. In their new ruling, the restrictions on the female category only reply to the 400, 800 and 1500 meter events. If the women who are affected by the rule, like Semenya, and there are a few others by the way, want to compete in those events, they have to take medication to lower their testosterone levels for six months prior to competition, or they can opt to compete in longer distances, or they can compete in the men's category. Now, of course, Semenya appealed this ruling, particularly since it would prevent her from defending her 800 meter title at the World Championships in September this year. As such, in June this year, the ruling was temporarily suspended while the appeal went ahead. However, on July 29th, that suspension was overturned by the Swiss Federal Tribunal, leaving Semenya well and truly in the lurch. Needless to say, a lot of people have a lot of opinions on this issue. On the one hand, there are those who are generally on the political left claiming the ruling is sexist and racist and that Semenya should be allowed to compete in the female category based on her gender identity. They also argue that testosterone does not give people a significant performance advantage. On the other hand, you have people who, from what I have seen, seem to be largely in the conservative camp, arguing that the sex differences that Semenya possesses should prevent her from competing in the women's sports category because they make her not a typically biological female. Therefore, the physical advantage that she has, they believe, is unfair. I also have an opinion on this, of course, but I'm guessing it's not the one most of you will expect me to have. What I think is grossly unfair is gifting biological women with an advantage by exempting them from competing against the best competitors in the field. I also think the way Semenya has been treated for years by the IAAF is disgusting. But before you start worrying that I've turned into a bleeding heart, gender obsessed social justice warrior, or that I'm denying that testosterone gives people an athletic advantage, fear not. I'm under no delusions about testosterone, nor have I suddenly joined the SJW squad. My argument is instead based purely on the principle of competition and what that actually entails. But before I go any further, I'm going to say this right now, I don't think this is cut and dry. Like I could make a whole nother video quite happily arguing the exact opposite of what I'm about to argue. It is all in how you frame it. Different sports, activities, hobbies, etc. attract people with certain exceptional abilities. Sometimes those abilities are so exceptional they surpass the norm. Whether this is because of biological anomalies or otherwise, identifying these abilities and applying them to the right fields is what produces all of the greatest achievements of the human race. This isn't unfair, it's simply the luck of the draw. Casta Semenya is one of those exceptional people. She has won the genetic lottery. Her unique genetics are ideally suited to athletics. That girl can run, and not because she's a man or trans or taking performance enhancing drugs, but because she lucked out dramatically when God was handing out abilities. 
She also had the sense to find a field that would allow those God-given abilities to flourish. What on earth is the problem with that? That's not unfair. That's just using your biological blessings appropriately to achieve excellence. And she is not the only person in the world with unusual qualities that give them an innate advantage over the competition. Let's consider, for example, Michael Phelps, arguably the greatest swimmer of all time. While his work ethic and incredible focus are huge contributors to his success, he also won the genetic lottery. His body is so suited for swimming that it's almost alien. At 6 foot 4 in height, he has a 6 foot 7 inches wingspan, so unusually long arms even for someone of his height, which propel him through the water better than your average swimmer. He also has a long torso and short legs, which cause him very little drag in the water, and unusually large feet, which act essentially as flippers. Not only that, he has an unusually large lung capacity. And while rumours that it is double that of the average man have not been confirmed, it is certainly abnormally large, giving him an enormous and, again, unusual advantage over the rest of the field. Considering all of Michael Phelps's genetic abnormalities, which give him a leg up, why is nobody screaming for him to be banned from certain events? If Casta Semenya can be precluded from certain events in the female category because of her genetic advantages, surely, on the principle of fairness, we should ban Michael Phelps too, right? No, God! Take the world of tennis. It helps as a tennis player if you are above average height because it gives you a powerful serve. Your typical men's tennis player is between about 5 foot 10 and 6 foot 4. However, there are some guys who really lucked out in the height department, unnaturally so, like Ivo Karlovic from Croatia. Ivo had the good fortune of growing to a height of 6 foot 11 inches. He is an amiable giant. Now, obviously, his height would prevent him from participating in certain activities, but one thing this unusual biological tray is suited for is tennis. His unnatural height gives him an enormous advantage on the serve. His longer arms generate more momentum when he hits the ball, and the length of his torso and legs allow him to see the court better. He has more of a bird's eye view. Also, these longer limbs make him particularly good at the net. His broader than usual wingspan makes it very hard for his opponents to get the ball past him. This is why even the very best male tennis players dread facing him, because if he is having a good serving day, which he generally is, and if the champion is even slightly off their game, Evo can beat anyone. Should we insist that Ivo Karlovic be banned from competition, or that he should take drugs to make him shorter and thus eliminate the advantage he has through being genetically different? Again, on the Casta Semenya principle, surely we should, because that's only fair. No! God, please, no! Or how about chess superstar Magnus Carlsen? At 21 years old, he is the youngest ever world number one, and is so talented he is known as the Mozart of chess. This guy is so good, he once played 10 chess matches simultaneously while blindfolded, and he won every game. Now, all champion chess players have a predisposition for intelligence and memory, but Magnus's abilities go beyond that. He has a photographic memory, that is, an ability to recall images from memory vividly after only a few instances of exposure with high precision. Very handy in chess. He also has an IQ of 190. That kind of true photographic memory and an IQ of 190 are not natural occurrences in human beings. Magnus is a genetic freak and has a perceivably unfair advantage over his opponents. But should we ban him from playing chess? Should we prescribe procedures he should undergo to make him dumber, like having a lobotomy or watching CNN? No! 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 Of course not. So why are people freaking out all over Casta Semenya? When you frame it like that, how are her genetic anomalies any different from a big brain, or being abnormally tall, or having a freakily proportioned body with abnormally large lungs? Remember also, Semenya has already had to prove her eligibility to compete as a woman. In 2009, when she was 18, she was subjected by the IAAF to a highly invasive medical procedure to determine her sex. The determination was that she is female. It's even on her birth certificate. 
There was never any contention when she was growing up that she may be a male. She has female genitalia. She has always been and lived as a girl. Yet not a typical girl, but certainly not a man. It's only recently that the powers that be have made noises again about her being biologically male and suggested that she alter her hormones. Speaking of hormones, Semenya has been there as well. From 2010, after she had been cleared by the IAAF as eligible to compete as a female, Semenya took birth control pills as recommended by the IAAF to lower her testosterone levels in accordance with the rules about testosterone at the time. She continued to do this until late 2015 when the ruling was suspended because of the Duty Chand case. During her recent appeal of the IAAF's reimposed testosterone ruling, Semenya stated that the hormones she took made her feel constantly sick, caused weight gain, abdominal pain and fevers, and prevented her from focusing for the five years she was taking them. Well, to that, all I have to say is... No shit, Sherlock! Of course fiddling with her hormones was going to have some side effects. That's how that works. And considering the fact that, yes, Semenya was not as dominant in competition during this time period, it's likely that the sickness and the brain fog she felt as a result of these side effects was as much responsible for her lessened performance as her lowered testosterone levels. Which is why she also stated that she will not be taking this medication again, and fair enough. She was treated like a lab rat. Bear in mind also that while Semenya does have higher testosterone levels and more manly qualities than your typically biological woman, her physicality is still not to the level where she can compete comfortably in the men's category either. Her testosterone level, yes, may be high for a woman, but it's still very much on the low side for a man, especially an athletic man. So why should she be stuck between the two categories? This brings me to what I find absolutely astounding about the two sides arguing over this issue. It astounds me that those making the argument that Semenya should be blocked from competition unless she takes the medication to reduce her testosterone are more often than not the ones who are vehemently against prescribing medication to adults with gender dysphoria to raise or lower their testosterone or to children who say they're trans. It also astounds me that the reverse is true. People who generally argue that it's fine for kids to take puberty blockers and that adults with gender dysphoria are perfectly safe to take hormones are arguing that Semenya shouldn't have to do the same because apparently that's bad and harmful when it doesn't suit your narrative. The inconsistency from both camps is mind-blowing. You can't have both, people. Pick one. Now, I may be many things, but I am nothing if not fair. I, funnily enough, don't like the thought of giving anyone elective hormones to alter their physiology. I don't even like the idea of women taking the pill. Because of that, there is no way I can say A-OK -okay to the idea of Semenya popping pills to artificially lower her testosterone, causing all sorts of side effects and potential damage for no other reason than her genetic gifts. And they are gifts, everyone. Make her hard to compete against. I do understand why the IAAF struggles with the Casta Semenya issue. It puts them in an extremely difficult position and it is going to be impossible to find an outcome that suits everyone. I get it. I get the argument. And I know that there are many, many ways to pick holes in everything I have just said. That is all fine. But for my money, it makes no sense to preclude women from the category who are, for all intents and purposes, female. They have female genitalia, they have female on their birth certificates, they've lived and competed their whole lives as female, they are definitely not trans and have never been men. And also, while yes, they have higher than average levels of testosterone for women, they're still not nearly high enough to compete comfortably in the men's category. Why should Casta Semenya be disadvantaged in this way, or have her biology artificially altered, causing her great physical and mental distress, for the sake of what is, essentially, a quality of outcome? If you liked that video, please remember to like, subscribe, share, leave me a comment, and if you really, really liked it, then check out the video description for my Subscribestar link and other ways you can support me.